Good evening, afternoon, night, morning, whenever you find a way to watch or listen to this podcast. It is Omar Rashan Borja, the Burger Popper, coming at you the day after week zero Saturday, which it was a great slate of games. It was small, but a great slate coming at you in my sit into my Sunday best after church and everything, church and shopping at Sephora with uh, my fiance and everything. And I'm joined. This is a historical moment because this is the first ever all red shirt sports podcast. I'm not saying it's branded that way, but we have two red shirt sports uh, people on a podcast. Me, of course, and I'm joined by the SoCon John Hooper um, for Red Shirt Sports. He does amazing work for our site, doing covering the SoCon and everything. And um, you'd be hard pressed to find someone more dedicated to the conference than John. So, John, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining this historical occasion. How's everything going? Uh, it's going great. Um, I'm not quite dressed in my Sunday best as as um, as you are, but uh, I. Like you, I enjoyed the game yesterday. It was a fascinating day. I think, you know, especially for the FCS teams out there, um, Montana State getting a, a win out close to your neck of the woods out there in New Mexico. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the HBCU game was was a really good game. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Game week is finally here, and we've got some football to talk about. And, particularly the Southern Conference, is they will kick off their TV schedule um, on Thursday night right, at uh, Five Star Stadium there in Macon, Georgia, when Presbyterian visits the Mercer Bears. Absolutely. And that's what I'm excited for, because I have a feature coming tomorrow uh, or Tuesday, probably Tuesday uh, after things cool off uh, about the um, about Presbyterian, what the game means for the Pioneer Football League on Metro Sports. So be aware of that one coming out. But we're here. Yeah, we are here talking about the uh, next star uh, game of the week schedule for the SoCon. And honestly, it's just a very it's very interesting. And I, I wouldn't say it's in a good way. Um, this yeah. this local TV schedule. So for context, the SoCon Next Star Game of the Week has been something that's been, I think, uh, a tradition since 2019, as far as mm-hmm. I can find with my research. It, where goes, next- it goes back even, I think, further than that. And oh, okay. But they've made alterations to it as far as, like, um, if they feature – they used to feature – it used to be more – I feel like it was more with basketball where they would feature a game each Saturday. So, like, it would be SoCon Saturdays or whatever, and it kind of – evolved into football as well um but yeah it's they they would feature you know a big matchup within the league each week and it's <laughs> it's looking like it's getting kind of away from that based on the matchups i'm looking at right here um because usually in a, in a it's kind of switched from the past because now it's more heavy on the non-conference schedule as opposed to the conference schedule. Usually you didn't see hardly any non-conference games featured. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, just for context, uh, like John said, it's a long-standing tradition. Uh, the only date I can find in terms of schedules for football uh, stretches back to 2019. But like John said, it's a, it's, uh, I guess, steeped in tradition longer than that. 2019, they had you had 13 games. And like you said, there was only one non-conference game in that 13-game 2019 mm-hmm. Next Star Station slate. It's declined over the years. Last year, there were eight games on the schedule, with one of them being non-conference still. But this year, like you said, it's heavy with non-conference. So just a quick read-off of the schedule. We have some TNF um, for Presbyterian at Mercer on a Thursday, this coming Thursday at 7 p.m., the next week, September 7th, you have Campbell from the CAA, Coastal Athletic Association, traveling to Western Carolina at 1 p.m. Then the next week, this was probably the biggest head scratcher, North Greenville, Division II at the Citadel at noon. Then on September 28th, the games take a, take a break. There is no game of the week on September 21st. Portland State from the Big Sky will travel to Chatt- Chattanooga for a primetime game on September 28th, 7 p.m. And then th- there won't be... A, a next star game of the week the entire week the entire month of October and the first two weeks of November where they pick up the slate without any momentum really uh Furman at East Tennessee State at noon on November 16th and on November 23rd the final week of the season it's not a wild card game as has been the recent custom but it will be a predetermined East Tennessee State BMI game with both schools not having winning records a prior year now did they prioritize? I mean, this is just a question that I'm wondering is ETSU there back to back weeks? 
Um, I get maybe they they paid extra money to <laughs> have the game, you know, featured. I, I'm not sure, uh, which is fine. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is only two of them being conference games and you've got four non-conference games and then there's no like what happened? Like, where did October go? Um, and I guess it, the, the question kind of answers itself is like, obviously the importance of the league race seems to not be a, a factor. It's like a non-factor when making these decisions. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I absolutely would agree that the league race is a non-factor really. I think, uh, you we mentioned before as we were talking about this before we went live, like Chattanooga is not playing a conference game on this slate. They do play Portland State, which a win the over league a, favorite. <laughs> yeah, the, the league favorite, the yeah, the league favorite from last year, a playoff team from last year, won't play a conference game, even though a game against Portland State, I would say it's a bit of a statement win, even though it's uh even though Portland State's a middle of the road big sky team. To beat a big sky school, I think it's a big deal for really any of the conferences that aren't either the Missouri Valley Conference or yeah. I believe the Western Carolina Chattanooga game last year was was that a game? Was that a next star game? Or I actually was don't it? think it was. I okay. don't think it was to be honest with you. That I was gonna say if that one was featured, that was absolute absolutely I mean, maybe I'm biased, but that was one of the best games I saw all year. Like Yeah. I for, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um and you like I feel like you're missed like when you get away from the conference games, you're missing some of that entertainment value. I know back when East Tennessee State won it, I do know for a fact that the Western Carolina East Tennessee State game in 2000, uh, this is 21. No, hold on. I guess, well, I watched this game. I don't know if they had the game of the week feature, but it was 2018 because it was the year East Tennessee State won it for the first time. And that game went to over, that, that was absolutely a great game. I know it was televised because uh, I remember the dis- description of the plays by uh, at the end of the game by Pete Entity. So uh, I'm not sure what they called it back then, but it was like the it was a it was a great game because it ended up. Um, I think Furman had won earlier in the day against Wofford, and then on that same day back in 2018, that game there was a lot pending on that game because Wofford and Furman were tied atop the standings with East Tennessee state. And they all ended up um, with, I think two losses. So it was a three-way tie, but you know, there was some drama because if, if Western had won that game, then it would be Wofford and Furman would you know be tied for first. And there were some playoff implications too, because I think only Furman got left out of the playoffs that year because they had a game canceled against Colgate. So it came down to like head to head and, and um, East Tennessee had beaten Furman and Furman beaten Wofford. But they, at the end of that, they had had more games. They had more qualification wins, I guess is what you would call it. Because Furman only played 10 games. I think they were six and four at that point. So it's situations like that, that going back to my original point is like, you, you've got a game that's involving a league leader and the other teams have already played and that, you know, they're fixated on the result of this game that's now in overtime, you know? So um, I think you miss some of that when you get away and start doing, I obviously do miss that when you get away and just start doing non-conference games. Yeah. That's a big thing about the league race. Um, and that's something that the conference had with the, uh, the the wild card game and everything, which like these games are early in the season. And I think they we both know that they lose a lot of momentum from that break that they take from October 5th all the way to November 16th, where there won't be a game until Furman at East Tennessee State. My thing is, too, is like with the non-conference games, only the only marquee, I guess there are a couple of uh, non-conference games that are. I guess good showcases for the league on a national level, like Campbell, Western Carolina. Campbell is a team that's always been close to the playoffs, almost there. Like I said, and then of course, Portland Chattanooga, like we discussed earlier, but the other two non-conference games, Presbyterian Mercer, and especially North Greenville Citadel, those do little to showcase the league in games that are acceptable to the most people in the region. So that's where I scratch my head there, where it's like, there's, there's definitely other non-conference games in the SoCon that they could have chosen. 
but Presbyterian, North Greenville, it's like it's a win-lose, it's a lose-win situation. The league loses a lot if they showcase a game where Mercer gets defeated at home against a Pioneer Football League team. Same thing for the Citadel, losing to a Division II team at Johnson Haygood. Not good for the league, but it's like you beat those yeah. teams. Like, what what does it say for the league? Right, and the thing about it is, like, you got to – if you're presenting your league in the best light, so Western Carolina has the best attendance. Why are there not more games, like, televised from Western Carolina? Because that – that makes your that makes your overall product look good because you got people, you know, in the stands, and I know they have a really good band, and 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 to me that would be like, I think they play Chattanooga and Western play, um, maybe like, do they play the the nineteenth maybe or the twenty sixth? They play the twenty sixth, I think, of October. Um, but. That game, like, you don't have that game on, and it's likely, I mean, that's going to be one of the games that decides the conference, and you've got the attendance factor with Western hosting that game. I, I love Finley Stadium, but it's so big that sometimes when Chattanooga has home games, there's just large spaces of, you know, empty seats, but you don't have that in Cully with, with Western Carolina because they have a smaller stadium and more – college football like atmosphere um so i mean i would if if i'm the commissioner i'm looking at it like well i want to put i want to put mercer western as much as i can and in even east tennessee because they and they're on there twice but they seem to draw well and if you're if you're doing non-conference games how are we not getting east tennessee state and north dakota state on there like I mean, that game's in Johnson City. I mean, arguably one of the more intriguing matchups of the non-conference schedule for the SOCON, and no one's televising that game. I mean, outside ESPN3 or whatever, I don't understand that. And I guess the game they have in place of it is the Citadel North Greenville, if, if my dates are right. Yeah, I think um, September 14th, if um, that, that's Citadel, that's North Greenville at the Citadel. I think with that one, I do agree with uh, North Dakota State and East Tennessee, but I think that might be the league counting its counting its losses with uh, East Tennessee State and not embarrassing the league against um, North Dakota State. I mean, that, I mean even though I mean, even that, yeah, I know, I, but I'm I'm looking at more of a crowd atmosphere type right. deal, and I would venture to guess that the atmosphere. Then it would be between the Citadel and the North Greenville. I could be wrong, but um, and you know, I, and you do take that chance. I mean, but we're talking about like if you really want to make a dedication to seeing the league progress and you know overtake maybe the CAA is is one of the three power leagues. You got to take that risk. I mean, um, yeah, they might get embarrassed, but it might be a good game. You never know. I mean, um. I think, I think that you might be taking just as much of a risk with North Greenville, <laughs> embarrassing the Citadel. So, like, um, because there's a lot of unknowns, but I think you got to put that game on and just risk it. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Like, like I said, like, uh, the North Greenville Citadel game is a lose win situation, and I think it's a win win for um, East Tennessee where you get the viewership. And if they lose to North Dakota State, it's North Dakota State. It's expected because, you know, they're North Dakota yeah. State. Um, so I totally agree with that. Uh, my, my thing, too, the other big omission, on for in my opinion, um, yours, of course, you, of course, mentioning East Tennessee State, North Dakota State. We talked about this before. Where is the military classic of the South on this schedule? Yeah, because that, looking that's... at the markets showcase, like it's like Charleston, of course, Citadel Market. You got Lynchburg, Roanoke, BMI Market. But the other three markets, I, I mean, Greenville, Spartanburg, Asheville, that is a – those are, of course, firm in the, the South Carolina SOCON markets. Um, 
But I think for casual fans, right, the, the diehards will always watch their school play. But for the casual fans in the area watching on local channels with not much other options because their cord cutter is not willing to pay for either YouTube TV or ESPN Plus, like, I think the casual fans will gravitate more in the, I guess, in those areas, even if there are markets for the South Carolina schools. The casual fan that likes the SEC will gravitate more towards the Citadel VMI than Furman, Wofford, or, um, you know, I guess any of the Carolinas was playing each other because of the military aspect, because of the uniqueness. And I think the, I think next star, I think part of why everyone loves army Navy is the spectacle and what CBS puts into it. You mm-hmm. can't, I, I don't think you can deny what CBS puts into army Navy, not playing a role into yeah. why it's, it's enjoyed. I think if next star were to roll out the red carpet for seat for the Citadel VMI and really showcase the rivalry, showcase the, architecture the i guess the routine of both schools of, both, of cadets and uh, cadets at both schools i think the league would benefit a lot um in, in attracting the casual fans just through that rivalry I, I think there's a lot maybe going on like you can tell a lot from you know the scaled down schedule one it's an indication that college football is moving in a in a different rapid direction um the two, I think it, it signals maybe the change in leadership that you had at the conference office last year. The, what the emphasis is on is, is on now. Maybe, and we don't know this yet, but I'd like to go back and look at last year's basketball schedule, maybe this year's basketball schedule, and, and compare it to what's being, you know, put forth as far as football, not, you know, making any estimations or anything like that but I mean at some point I guess maybe some of these FCS conferences are having to make make the the choice of do we dedicate more to basketball or do we dedicate more to football what does our visibility need to be like can we should we cut this and want should we cut football here and add the basketball like I don't I don't know what goes on behind closed doors but if I, if if I, if the basketball schedule comes out and there's 35 games on there or something then I'll be able to <laughs> I'll be able to use deductive reasoning um but I did you know last at last year's not this year's but the 23 23 Southcom media day uh the commissioner Michael Cross was saying you know we got to put our best foot forward for football because it's the only league in which we've got a real logistic, a legitimate chance to win. I mean, a national title in like for like, yeah, I mean, it's possible in other sports, but in football, it really is that that is the bread and butter. And it's been kind of the tradition of the league while it's been good in basketball um I feel like the drive the kind of the driving force behind it over the years you know has been football if you look back to the 80s and 90s and even the the early 2000s yeah I agree I think I think um something that might shift the league's focus might have shifted the league's focus away from basketball um like you seem to imply is I think uh App State's departure contributes mm-hmm. a lot to that um and also the emergence of the southern conference like really being a legitimate like threat to be a two-bit league each year year in year out like Furman, wofford and everything it's like because when i think when I, i'll be honest when i think about the socon i think more about basketball like there there have been some great teams like on the fcs level like east tennessee state had their run and everything mm-hmm. with quake right. um but i think more about wofford like pulling you know pulling the upsets like for Furman against UVA. I think about UNC right. Greensboro as yeah. well, just consistently having great teams. Um, that's what I think of. So, I mean, I, I think, I think the shift to basketball, if they take a big 12 like approach where it's like, we are a basketball league that plays football well, but we are first and foremost a basketball league. I can see the league doing that. And I, and I think there's a lot of value. And like you said, like looking at the, the next star 
basketball slate uh, for this year because I, I I think I I'll be honest like I just I just think more about the Southern Conference in terms of basketball like they're not they're not exactly on par with the West Coast Conference the Atlantic Ten but right. I'd put them on the level right now of uh, Missouri Valley Conference without Loyola. But if, if the league could get to that level of the West Coast Conference or somebody like that, it would be I think to them looking at it purely like that the visibility of having more basketball games on would be more worth worth it more despite the fact that you can win a national championship in football. I think they're looking at it like we've got millions of people watching Furman Upset Virginia, whereas, you know, yeah, it's great that we do great good in football, but like at the end of the day, it's that basketball has the potential to drive it forward more but less of a potential to get national acclaim, you know, like they're not going to win a national, you know what I mean? Like, um, because there is such an emphasis on the upset in basketball and the first two, you know, first weekend of the tournament that it's almost, if you get an upset there, it's almost as good as, you know, a football team winning a national championship. Um, that being said, from my perspective, I've always kind of been the a football guy, so um, it, I like the fact that the league is really strong in, in basketball, and um, but it's kind of, it, it's, I'm kind of torn on it because I feel like you have to the way NCAA athletics is now, Division One athletics. I think you have to make a decision as an FCS conference to dedicate more of your attention to one sport over the other and, and power conferences don't have to do that. And that's sort of the unfairness of what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's sad because like, I feel like, like you said, like people care more about what happens in the first or second week of the tournament than they do during the season where it's like, you know, uh, Furman or Wofford or UNCG can have a great win in a multi-team event. Uh, but it goes completely ignored because right. most of America focuses on the tournament, right? Where compared to football, it can be the most inconsequential game. Like I, I think like uh, I'm not sure if uh, in 2015 when sit when the Citadel beat South Carolina, I'm not even sure if they were a playoff team. But people remember that because yeah, yeah, they, of... they they went that year. They were pretty okay. good. But like okay, so when they beat the Citadel beat Georgia Tech, um, was that 18, 19? It was 19. It was 19. 19. So they weren't a playoff team that year. Um, right. So, which is, you know, kind of interesting. And, I, you know, I, I wonder, like, how much people remember those. And I know everybody remembers the Michigan. I mean, that game is an all-timer, you know, the, the App State over Michigan. Um, I, I wonder – you know, what the future is with the transfer portal and everything like that. I don't think you'll see as much of those like huge upsets where you had like James Madison beating Virginia Tech a few years later. And, um, but I mean, I, I also think that there's less opportunities. I mean, I don't, I wonder what's going to happen with the, if the power six say they're just going to go ahead and have their own national championship will they stop playing at fcs schools you know that'll be one thing um because that's a lot of fcs schools rely on the money you know that they get from a power five school um it's really not that beneficial to play a group of five school um if you can avoid it but i think i think in the next few years we're going to find out a lot about what is the, you know, the scholarship question? Like, how do we need this many scholarships? Um, can we put that money somewhere else? You know, what what are, what's the future in game for FCS football? And it's so it's I feel like it's really reliant a lot more on FBS football now and what they're going to do more than it ever has been. And that that to me is a little bit scary. Um, and I think that's sort of the elephant in the room that no one's really talking about. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, I, I just think, I don't think anyone really knows what's in store for the future of, across, I think, at least Division One. I. I think Division Two and Division Three are, of course, like more stable, really, in terms like they know what they are. But it's like with FBS and Group 5, there's that like ambiguity. Like no one's really sure like um, whether, I guess, a Group of Five is more like the FBS or I guess. I think Group like of five, five is in worse shape than the FBS yeah. is because, you know, like if the FBS, if that happens, then they like do they drop back to FCS or you know like I, there's a lot of questions that would that I would wonder about that and that to me like when App State moved out and, and Georgia Southern I know they did it for money I just it just it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you're not really and I'm a, I'm an App State grad but you're not really I mean unless you just have one, one in a million season, you're probably not going to be able to compete for a national champ or even make the expanded playoff, which is crazy. But that's yeah. just the reality of it. Yeah, I agree. Like, we, we don't know, I guess, what's going to happen with these leagues or, um, or I guess, like, with the structure of college athletics. But I guess going back to our, I guess, our topic. Um, yeah, sorry, I got off. Before, topic. No, it, it's it all, all good. It kind of goes hand in hand, but like it does. We're we're trying to figure out why there is a skimmed down schedule, like because it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you try to reason it. Um, because the and the matchups really aren't. I mean, Campbell, Western Carolina is okay. Uh, I mean. Certainly, North Greenville and <laughs> Citadel. I mean, I I, I kind of get that they're trying to be fair to every school and um and try to you know showcase each campus. I get that, uh, but then you don't have Wofford on there at all, <laughs> so I don't know what that. And then you have East Tennessee State, which I'm fine with, but you have them on there twice where you might put Wofford on one of those weeks. Um, and then Sanford's not even featured. That's another one. It's, yeah. I think uh, I think part of that has to do with um, Sanford, like I guess the Birmingham. Yeah, the Birmingham affiliate, like not there, they're not being a next star station. But um, out of these six games, John, I wanted to ask uh, which yeah. one I think are you looking forward to the most? I know there aren't many choices, but um, I guess which of these games are you looking forward to the most and which one uh, is probably the best game on this slate? Man, that's a good question. Uh, I actually don't think the, I don't think the PC Mercer game is going to be probably worth your, I mean, it'll be worth it for Mercer fans, but uh, I would say, man, i tell you the two conference matchups aren't bad. I mean, I think East Tennessee State, uh, that's a game I actually picked Furman to get upset in at the uh, – because I think they'll be – I think East Tennessee State will be decent. I mean, they'll, they'll be one of those teams that are like a dark horse type team this year. BMI the same way. I think that, you know, that game – those two games will be very good games. As far as the non-conference goes, uh, Portland State and Chattanooga is kind of fascinating to me, I mean, to be honest, Um, because Portland State is, from what I know about them, they were an improved team last year. They have a a dual-threat quarterback that, you know, they're really really good offensively. Um, It's just that'll be – that could be a high-scoring matchup. Uh, and so, yeah, Portland State, being from the big sky, I know they're not a, you know, a regular contender in that league, but they have a great history. Um, a lot of people don't know, like, was it Jerry Glanville and, like, June Jones, I believe, coached out there. And they kind of um, revolutionized, like, the was it the um, run and shoot offense, so. Um, that's back in the day, but they they've always been known for that, and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to that matchup because there is some history with that program and how they were. A, I think they were a power at like the Division two level um, prior to to being an FCS school. Um, so that one kind of fascinates me because it's also a chance for the SoCon to look good against 
Big Sky team. And I was kind of wanting to know if Western Carolina and I don't know what the Big Sky's TV package looks like, but I was wondering if the F, the Western Carolina and Montana game might be a part of it. Yeah, so I know Montana. I know the Montana script sports stations, local stations air, I think, all the Montana, Montana State games. So that'll be on local TV, local uh, over-the-air television in uh, the Montana market. So that's going to get prime visibility in Montana, uh, the Western Carolina Montana game. I think yeah. I I, I want to agree. Um, I I, I want to agree with uh with what you said about Furman East Tennessee State. That's a game that looking at last year on the road, East Tennessee State almost went in and upset Furman. Furman's losing mm-hmm. a lot of pieces this upcoming year. Uh, that that's honestly one that stands out to me, and I think it, that's uh that's I'd say it's one of my top two since um, I have my countdown coming out. I, I'd say the other one that um I'm not gonna say which one I I am looking forward to more. The other one would be Campbell versus Western Carolina. It's the first meeting between those two schools. They're both in North Carolina, mm-hmm. and Campbell. This game would have a lot more um shine to. It if a uh, Hodge Malik Williams were still there, which Heck I don't yeah. know. Why, yeah, I don't know why he went to UNLV. Like they they got the FCS quarterback All Star team with Matt Sluka and Hodge yeah. Malik Williams there. There's almost no need really, um but I think <laughs> it still should be fascinating because they find a way. Like um like Coach Minter is finding a way to get talent out there to uh, to Bowie's Creek. Um, not sure how, but he he's getting good talent there. So that's when the interest me. And of course, like Western Carolina, they have the playoff drought. There's a bit of a drop off because Desmond Reed transferred. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those are the two that, that was, I'm looking uh, for. Yeah, like Campbell is interesting. Um, they've been a program that's sort of been on the cusp for a while. Yeah. And I want to say they have a new head coach. Uh, there. Oh, it's not Coach Minter. Geez, that's embarrassing. <laughs> No, but like he, something happened with him in the end of last year, and I'm not sure if he left to take a job somewhere else or he was let go. Um, but I want to say they may have had a new coach last year. I'm not sure if it was last year. Or this would be his first year, but um, this is Braxton Harris. I just looked at Braxton Harris. Geez, I'm gonna have to edit that out. But I stand by. I stand by my error. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, like they. Are, they were a decent team like last year or two years ago. I want to say they gave William and Mary a really good game. And William and Mary was really good. I think that might have been one of their closest games during the regular season. And um, and so Campbell was like right there with a lot of teams. Uh, they may have they may have beat Elon that year too. I can't remember. But um I want to say that was a year that maybe they they had a lot of close games that they lost because a lot of people they they beat the citadel um that year and then you know a lot of people that at the beginning of the year and they thought you know that might be a team that we could look at as far as maybe making a push for the fcs playoffs but i think that was during their transition to that might have been their first year in the caa actually yeah i mean yeah, like you said, they're on the edge, really, and they've had a lot of close they've games. They've got great facilities, too. Like, it's yeah, that's what I heard. That, like, a place like Booze Creek would have a nice, like, nice facilities, and they get really good recruits, and it's out in the middle of nowhere, and they're just like, what are they doing to get people to, you know, to come out here to, um, to the middle of nowhere, really, and, and play football? But I feel like they've never been able to escape mediocrity since they've been given scholarships the state oh no oh, not mute okay i think they should have stayed honestly in the big south i think if they wanted a playoff um chance but that conference the stability that conference was in question so i really don't blame them for jumping ship it's just one of those things where it's like they're a small fish in a big pond but that being said like it's like the same thing with um chattanooga beating portland state a win over the caa it's a great statement for um the so for the SoCon. Uh so I am looking forward to that game in state rivalry. I'm surprised it's the first meeting between the two schools. Yeah. Uh, really surprised at that, but it should be Yeah, you would think being in the same in the same uh state that like they would have you know crossed paths at some point. Um yeah. 
And that, that's one thing about Western Carolina has got a really great, like you, that's another game. There were so many misses on the, the non-conference slate here. And I'm pretty sure, I, obviously, with the game being at Elon, that will be a flow sports game. But, like, there's so many good – Western Carolina has a really good non-conference schedule. Um, and then, obviously, they'll open up on the ACC network on Thursday night against a very good North Carolina State team, I think. Um, so – I'm just trying to think of non-conference games because if they're going to feature these games up, there's several that I feel like they've missed on, missed out on maybe. Um, no, I know Chattanooga plays two FBSs. They've got at Tennessee and at Georgia State, which is a very winnable game for them. Um, and then the Portland State, I like that game because um, – that's a like the cross country right conference matchup that we don't see a lot of, and then at the end of the year they play Austin P, which is, you know, you mentioned Western Carolina and Campbell. I think Austin P and Chattanooga have only played like eight times in their history, and they're not that far apart from each other. So that makes makes me wonder why. Like they did play in the playoffs last year, so. But that's another good matchup. You know, I feel like uh, is Austin P's in the UAC, is that right? Yes, they are in the UAC. So that's yeah. another, like, conference out there that you don't see a lot of. You see a few more games, but you don't see a lot of cross SOCON UAC matchups. Yeah, and I think that's because of the conference's sprawl, um, really. I mean, with it being a whack pace on um, Love Child. But um, <laughs> that's a that's really all I had regarding the, the schedule. Like this. It, um, it is, yeah. It's it's a time bomb. It's 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 a ticking time bomb in terms of I guess the live team conference. My thing is, it just to me this leaves a lot to be desired because there's a lot of I don't know, and I and I don't know what went behind the decisions to limit it to six games. I know last year was eight. And then I guess were the last two weeks for wild card games. Is that right? So like the last, I think. Well, I think the one last, last one at least. One of them was uh, was Farmer Wofford was one. I, I feel like, and maybe Sanford and Mercer. Maybe. I think so. I'd have to check. Um. I have to check Matt Sars board to see which one. Two years ago, I I know two years ago was not Sanford and Mercer was not, but it has been the game of the week before. That's a good little matchup. That like I know they don't include Sanford because of the reasons you mentioned, but like when it's at Mercer, that's a they they that's a kind of an emerging rivalry, I guess. Because Sanford really doesn't have a natural rival in the sofa. Or does Mercer. So, which is, I guess, kind of fascinating to me because I guess Mercer's rival is sort of everyone. Yeah, I I would agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard to think of who Sanford's rival really is. I mean, I'll let you say that. I would say Chattanooga, but like Chattanooga's one like, 36 of the last 40 matchups between two or something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the series history, but it's like you say, like it's leave, like the schedule leaves much to be desired. And like we said at the, at the offset of, at the onset of this, uh, this podcast, we went from 13 games in 2019 to eight last year and now to six with uh, three or with four of them being non-conference games. So it's just a wonder, like you say, like what happened behind closed doors. But I think we've covered everything with the schedule. Um, hopefully it gets better or hopefully the league comes up with a strategy that uh, replaces this plan for um, local for the local TV games on Nexstar. But um, John, do you have any final statements regarding this or any or anything SoCon related, especially as we head into the first week of SoCon football this weekend? I'm looking forward to it. I I, I just wondered at some point in the season if they might add in some of those October matchups like we got 
um, the Furman uh, Chattanooga game and then the the Western Carolina Chattanooga game. They're all right there together. I think in consecutive weeks. I think you have Furman Western, Chattanooga Western, and Furman Chattanooga. So a lot will be decided in the month of October that I think you're missing by not just having at least just one of those games on. Like, it doesn't have to be all of them, but it's kind of baffling that you wouldn't have any of them. So, um, but I'm looking forward to, it. I think it should be a great season. Um, I think the SOCON's going to be pretty good this year. Uh, and there's a lot, I think there's a lot more of fan interest and intrigue about the non-conference schedule because you've got Western Carolina, Montana, um, you know, some of the Chattanooga, even Portland State is one we mentioned, but you got all the CAA matchups with, with the SOCON, BMI, William & Mary will be on Wednesday or Thursday night, so that'll kick it off, and we'll kind of have that throughout the non-conference schedule, which is, is pretty fascinating, some, some really good matchups. Yeah, I do agree. Plenty of in-state matchups, like you said. Um, plenty of intersectionals as well. There's a little bit of everything for everyone. A little bit of something for everyone with uh, the SoCon non-conference schedule. So I'm, I'm excited for the league as well. Um, I mean, the, the SoCon typically has a lot of parity. I mean, it's very cyclical. I mean, just a couple of years ago, like you mentioned, East Tennessee State was on top of the league, and now they're sort of in the middle. It's not at the bot at, at around the bottom, but who knows this year? Like, um, there's a lot of parity. Like, we saw a lot. Uh, we saw a couple big upsets almost happen, like East Tennessee Furman State. So I'm excited mm -hmm. as well. I'm excited to dig a little bit more, uh, especially after reading the stuff that you put out for Redshirt Sports, uh, which I guess leaves me at uh, is it. Besides uh, Redshirt Sports, is there anything else that you are on that you want to plug to the general audience of the Hardware Podcast? Uh, well, actually, I do write a little basketball stuff for Mid Major Madness. So I cover the SOCON and then some Sunbelt stuff too uh, for that website. So I enjoy, I enjoy covering the Mid Major landscape of basketball, uh, similar to my interest in FCS football. So um, but yeah, if you want to catch my stuff, it's also on there. And um, I always enjoy your stuff, Omar. I, I know that I was saw the the article. I'm interested to read. I haven't read it yet about the controversy behind the Norfolk State game the last time they were on ABC. So I'm looking forward to to reading that. And as usual, I've I've never read a writer that is able to bring out so many interesting things that I had not heard about before. And I've heard of a lot of stuff, but um, you have a, a knack for that. So you're really talented in, in doing that. So just want to give you a little bit of a uh, pat on the back for that, Omar. Oh, well, thank you, John. That really means a lot. I mean, I look at writers like you uh, to improve, look at your stuff and see how I can improve, become more like you. And it really means a lot coming from you, really hearing those words. Um, so I really appreciate it. I did not know you were on Mid-Major Madness. Um, each year I tell myself I'm going to take in more college basketball. But um, I'm going to read more about this, about your stuff on the Sunbelt, especially because everyone knows the Sunbelt is a football exclusive league. Like yeah. I know last year, like James Madison almost didn't make the tournament with 30 wins. Like if they didn't win their title, yeah. which like, blows my mind that that's where we're at in college basketball right yeah it's as it and they, and they got in and they you know they won a game and they were really good i mean you know they were tournament worthy so to speak so absolutely um, yeah but it's it's gotten ridiculous it's gotten ridiculous to where you, what you have is similar to how if you're a group of five teams trying to make the, the fbs football playoff now because they expanded it for more sec teams right <laughs> that's that's basically what the expansion is. Yeah, essentially. I mean, hopefully it doesn't end up that way. But yeah, it's I mean, looking at the top 10, that's looks that looks like the direction that we are headed with the playoff. Um, but I think that's all I wanted to cover today. John, okay. thank you for joining us, for joining, I guess, joining the podcast today for uh, this. Uh, hopefully this may, might be a look into the future of the hardware um, podcast where maybe there's uh, some sort of merger with Richard mm -hmm. Sports. I'll have to talk to James about it. But yeah. for everyone listening, watching at home, thanks for joining. Thanks for staying to the end. And until, not, until next time, everyone, peace, love, and soul, the Burger Popper.